Hi, hi everyone. Really good to see you. Um, my name is Teresa Longo. If you don't know me, I'm the director of the Reeves Center for International Studies. The work we do here focuses on global education, global engagement, and support for international students and scholars. So today we're here for um, a very exciting reason, a lecture by our guest, Dr. Nagwan Solomon, and I'm looking forward to introducing her to you. But first I want to do just a few thank yous. First to uh, Richard Kramer and the Kramer family. Their generosity <coughs> provides the opportunity for scholars specializing in Islamic law and governance to share their expertise with our university community. Thank you also to the faculty committee, Andrea Wright, Sharon Grewal, and Christy Warren, who identify the Kramer lecture series speakers. And thank you to the Reeves Center's global engagement team, Tyler Lawrence, Kate Hoving, Diane Allman, for the work that made this event possible. Now to our honored guest. Dr. Solomon earned her PhD in social and political sciences from the European University Institute in Italy and her master's in political science from Cairo University. She has received doctoral fellowships from the European University Institute and the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. She was a Reagan Fassel Democracy Fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy, a doctoral fellow of the Middle East Directions Program of the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies, and a visiting fellow at the Institute of International Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, Freie Universite Ber Berlin, and the University of Amsterdam. She's a very global um, individual. Her scholarly record is compelling, as are her interactions with communities in the Middle East and across the globe. Her work is a shining example of what it looks like to successfully combine academic expertise with commitment to democracy. Now, Juan, we are very honored to have you here. I will turn the floor over to you now. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Teresa Longo, for kind in introduction. And I'm very honored to be named as the uh, 2022 Kramer Middle East Distinguished Scholar in Residence by the River Center for International Studies and the Center for Comparative Legal Studies and Post-Conflict Peace, Peace Building at William and Mary Law School. Thank you very much for kind hospitality and inviting me to share my thoughts with you all. And thank you everyone for coming tonight. As in my speech, I focus on the pro-democracy social movements in the Arab region. I cannot neglect what is going on against democracy in Ukraine. As you know, on the eve of February 24th, Russian President Vladimir Putin launched a full-scale invasion into Ukraine, which resulted in the occupation of several cities and the ev evacuation more than 1.7 million Ukrainians into neighboring countries. Several media websites reported that more than 474 civilians, including 14 children, have been killed and more than 1,684 people, including more than 116 children, have been wounded. Through this aggression, Putin aims to expand the number of authoritarian regimes in the world by overthrowing Ukrainians' democratically elected government and installing an authoritarian replacement. In fact, Putin's regime, regime has routinely employed political and military force to end democratic social movements in Central Asia and the Arab region. A prominent example is Putin's support of the Assad regime, which saw Russia, along with China, provide political support for the regime at the UN Security Council. Additionally, Russia and Iran supplied military support that allowed Assad regime to kill more than 500,000 civilians by 2021. According to Amnesty International, <laughs> an estimated 13,000 people have been executed in Syrian prisons, and thousands more, and thousands more are reported to, to have died from torture by the Syrian government. 
According to the United, State, United, United Nations Refugees Agency, more than 6.6 .6 million Syrians have been forced to flee their country since 2011, and another 6.7 million people remain internally displaced. I request a minute of silence for victims of repressive regimes, occupation, and military inv invasion in Ukraine, Syria, and all the world. Thank you. As you know, this year, 2022, marks the 11th anniversary of the uprising that swept the Arab world in late 2010 and early 2011. These uprisings demanded the full down of authoritarian regimes and advocated for the creation of new democratic governments that would provide freedom, good governance, and human dignity for all citizens. In my speech, I will share with you my thoughts about the pro-democracy social movements in the Arab countries, and I will give a particular focus on the Syrian uprising for two reasons. First, we are approaching the 11th anniversary of the Syrian uprising in March 15, and second, because of Russia's support for the Assad regime militarily and politically to stop the pro-democracy uprising. Let me start with inviting you to watch a short video from BBC News that lists the main stages of the first wave of the Arab uprising. I never intended to stand as a candidate for another term. They love me, all my people with me. They love me all. They, they will die to, to protect me, my, my people. The Arab uprising that began in Tunisia in December 2010 surprised Western and Arab scholars, politicians, activists, and even those who called for demonstrations. All were shocked by the highly participation in the demonstration, which included people from diverse socioeconomic, religious, and political backgrounds. The Arab dictators never expected that people would revolt against them one day. I distinctly remember that even after the Tunisians succeeded in removing President Ben Ali in, 14, in January, for, uh, January 14, 
Middle Eastern scholars and politicians asserted that other Arab countries, people would not or would not do the same. However, they were proved wrong. As Egyptians revolted against their long-term president, Hosni Mubarak, aimed official statements from many democratic and non-democratic governments in the Europe and the USA and MENA region that supported Hosni Mubarak and were against the Egyptians' uprising. This case reminds us to be humble while an analyzing the Arab region and be careful when we suggest conclusions about the death of the pro-democracy social movements in the Arab region, even when its political scene are gloomy and dark. From my perspective, as a social movement studies scholar, scholar I argue that the Arab uprising did not happen overnight. It was a result of actions that had accumulated over years or even decades. That included scattered demonstrations, strikes, and sit-ins over various local, regional, political, economic, and social issues. In other words, the Arab uprising was a result of accumulated process of dissent non-institutional experiences and hopes. There, through a variety of type of actions, pro-democracy social movements activists began to understand the mechanism of challenging authoritarian regimes, connecting with each other, regardless of their political and ideological backgrounds, learned from their and other movements' mistakes, and waited for local and, reg and regional triggers to mobilize people. In that respect, I argue that the Arab uprising that started in December 2010 is a continuation of Arab social movements that have been present since 1950s and 1960s, after national military generals took power in some of the Arab countries. These social movements have protest cycles, and each one had framed specific socioeconomic and political demands. After 1952, when national military generals conducted military interventions to seize power in Egypt, Syria, Libya, Yemen, Tunisia, Sudan, and Algeria, the Arab social movements framed their political demands to be freedom and political change. In this period, the leaders, general of, uh, generals of the military coups, claimed that would provide economic equality to the poor and middle classes by nationalizing all companies and institutions at the expense of freedom of expression and political rights. In reality, they failed to follow through on any of their promises. Moreover, the general's authoritarian regimes posed many challenges to civil society organizations operating in the Arab context. These regimes restricted the registration of civil society organization and organizations and harassed and detained their members. Additionally, the regimes weaponized the media to label civil society organizations as agents of foreign countries and claimed so civil society organizations worked against the national interests of their respective countries. Although the civil society organizations faced restrictions from Arab authoritarian regimes, their members alongside activists, politicians, and academics organized informally and benefited from any regional and local opportunity to mobilize people for, for policy change. Since 2000, a new protest cycle has started with socioeconomic rights, overt democratic change, and ending the rule of the long-term presidents as it is main demands. In December 2010, this protest cycle crystallized into revolutions that swept the Arab region and achieved one of the movement's demands, which was the removal of long-term presidents such as Ben Ali, Mubarak, Ali Abdullah Saleh, and Gaddafi. The Arab uprising, or the Arab Spring, that started in 2010 was triggered by both local and regional stimuli and was not only the results of popular discontentment, but also popular hope. The local trigger of Tunisians 
and at the same time, the regional one for the, Arab, for the other Arab countries was the self-emulation of the young Tunisian fruit seller, Mohammed Bouazizi. This is the picture of Mohammed Bouazizi, who set fire of, to himself outside the provisional head, headquarters of his hometown in protest against local police officials who had seized his cart. Given that Tunisians, like other Arab citizens, had suffered decades under the repressive policies of the Tunisian regime, no freedom of expression, no registration for independent civil society organizations, high levels of corruption among the ruling elite and the bad governance, Tunisian people revolted against the long-term President Ben Ali and removed him from the office. The success of Tunisians in removing Ben Ali gave hope to Egyptians who had already reached the highest level of anger. The Egyptian activists seized the regional opportunity to call for demonstrations against Mubarak and his regime of, on the, the 25th of January 2011. They used the murder of Khalid Saeed. This is a picture of Khalid Saeed, a young man who was killed by police as a local trigger to mobilize people against the regime repressive policies. Surprisingly, significant number of Egyptians from different governorates participated in the demonstrations on the January 28th and called the day the Friday of anger. The removal of Mubarak, who was known as the strong man of the Middle East, on February 11, 2011, encouraged other Arab activists to adopt, to adopt street politics to obtain political change in their own countries. Thus, since January 27, 27 2011, revolutionary movements swept across more Arab countries, particularly Libya, Yemen, Syria, Morocco, and Bahrain. These countries all experienced collective mobilization where several civic and political actors and activists such as labor unions, professional and journalist associations, student unions, opposition political movements and parties, etc., played a vital role in mobilizing and motivating people to move from their balconies to square of liberation, or in Arabic we say squares of tahrir. People were motivated to protest for socioeconomic and political goals encapsulated in a concentrated, straightforward slogan, the people demand the fall of the regime. In Arabic, shab you read isqat in nizam. These demands notably reflect, reflect the uprising were political rather than religious or ideological revolutions. People from different political and ideological backgrounds united to demand regime change, liberty, good governance, and human rights. Remarkably, Islamist activists and secular activists collaborated to achieve the same political ends. Further, classical religious slogans such as Islam is the solution did not appear. The revolutions that occurred in the region initially took the form of mass demonstrations against repression, low standards of living, and limited or no space for freedom of expression or civic activism. Although the form and development of the uprising in each country was different, they all reflect, reflected the collective popular discontentment toward similar repressive state policies and various forms of deprivation faced by people across the region. Given these circumstances, people were inspired to revolt and call for Chan to change, and also they have a collective hope to replace authoritarian regimes by democratic system. Now I turn to the second part of my speech, where I will focus on Syria uprising against Bashar al-Assad regimes. On March 6, 2011, inspired by Tunisians and Egyptians' achievements, some Syrian students, none of them older than 15, wrote on their school walls, the people want the fall of the regime in the city of Dara in southwestern Syria. In response, the Syrian authorities detained and tortured them. When their families went to the local governor and 
pleaded for their release. He replied that if they missed their children so much, they should give him their wives and he would make them some new ones. The story made everyone in the town, relatives and people in the town very angry and made them talk to the street on the 11th of March 2011, marching to the governor's house to demand the children's release. They were met by bullets and some protesters were killed. The detention and the torture of the children, coupled with the death of some protesters, triggered many Syrians to demonstrate against the Assad regimes. Syrians asked themselves, what do we have to lose? In Damascus, people took the street on March 15th, demanding political reform. Three days later, on March 18th, a mass protest took place and security forces responded with live ammunition, murdering some more protesters and arresting others. After that date, demonstrations spread through several cities. The regime's immediate response was brutal, namely arresting, raping, torturing, and killing peaceful protesters. The regime applied indiscriminate repressive policies against protesters, sent the Syrian Arab army alongside Shabiha, Thug militia, to cities and villages to deal with the demonstrations and used live ammunition to disperse marches. In such a context, as a social movement scholar observed, more repression against many protesters from different backgrounds, ages, and cities increasingly motivates citizens to demonstrate against the regime. This is exactly what happened in Syria. The brutality of the regime's forces transfor transformed small protests into national-wide demonstrations. To mobilize people, activists used a mixture of new social media platforms and pre-existing social networks. Calls took the form of one-to-one -one invitations, mentions in Friday sermons, posters on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and other websites, and on TV channels. Syrian activists adopted peaceful methods of action such as demonstrations, collective gathering, chanting, and the like. Due to the, same, due to the regime's harsh, repressive response, Friday pri prayers, the only event where it was possible to gather large groups, were used as springboard for protest. Social movement studies scholars observed that in such a specific context, the authority used brutal repression and violence to deal with protest, provoked protesters to shift their tactics from peaceful to eventually violent means. These who make peaceful revolution impossible will make a violent revolution inevitable. This is the words of President John Kennedy mentioned in the speech in March 1962. That's exactly what happened in Syria. As the Syrian army invaded villages and ne neighborhoods, many protesters become inclined to shift from peaceful protest to armed struggle for self-defense. The transition to armed struggle had begun by June 2011, and by July, some Syrian army defecting officers established the first unit of the Free Syrian Army to prevent the regime from forcefully suppressing demonstrations. Moreover, small armed groups based on tribal ties, friendships, and neighborhood solidarity formed to counter the invasion of the Syrian army that were supported by Russia and Iranian militias. In other words, the Syrian regime's use of violence radicalized protesters, or in Arabic we say, Askarat al ihtijaj as regime, as, as regime repression prompted the gradual shift from peaceful to violent means, by mid-2012, the Syrian revolution situation had turned into a full-blown civil war. In this new context, Many armed groups from different backgrounds emerged and began to op operate in Syria. The conflict in Syria transformed from an internal conflict between pro- and anti-regime forces to an embrace of regional and international actors who had taken sides. The emergence of the Islamic State in Iraq and Levant 
ISIL in 2014 further complicated the scene and the context. From the first day of Syrian uprising, the United States of America and many democratic governments in Europe, alongside people and activists in the Arab Spring countries of Egypt and Tunisia and other, sided with Syrians and requested Bashar al-Assad's exit. On the other hand, Russia and regional authoritarian regime of Iran and China have firmly backed the Assad's regime with the political and military aid. Politically, Russia has used various UN instruments, particularly its Security Council veto, to block 14 actions, including condemnation, proposals, measures, resolutions against Bashar al-Assad regimes, brutality and use of heavy and chemical weapons against civilians. Militarily, the Russian sources over than 63,000 Russian troops deployed to Syria. And Russia has established two military bases within Syria. The, Syrian, the, the Russian defense minister proudly stated that most of Russia's latest weapon system have been tested in Syria. For example, in, 20, in 2014, Russia bombed Aleppo and used its veto to block calls to halt the Aleppo's bombing and a resolution that called for a truce. In one of my training workshops that I led, I met with Syrian survivors from Aleppo, and I remember that young lady that said to me, quote, the bombs were everywhere. The Russian airstrikes bombed hospitals, schools, houses. We didn't know where we should go. It was a hell. We only requested a no-fly zone to save our lives. The world was, was watching Russia and Assad regime kill us now. Therefore, today when the Ukrainian president, my Ukrainian friend, friends and the Ukrainian people called for a no-fly zone, I hear the voice of that young lady. Do the democratic governments want to watch Russia repeat the tragedy that it conducted in Aleppo and Grozny years before in Ukraine? Is it unrealistic to save lives and halt Russian aggression in Ukraine? Russia military and political support, along with the support of other authoritarian regimes in China and Iran, and recently some Gulf regime to Assad <coughs> regime, changed the balance of power in favor of Assad's regime, making Assad removal more difficult. But as many Syrian pro-democracy activists believe, it's not impossible. In fact, Russia, in fact, Russia and other authoritarian regime in China, Iran, and the Gulf have exerted extreme efforts not only to support counter-revolution and undemocratic actors in the Arab region, but also, but have also attempted to undermine democracy in well-established democratic countries in Europe and the USA. In the project that conducted by the National Endowment for Democracy, they developed a map that shows that the authoritarian influencers, as you see here, Russia, Gulf region, and some Gulf countries, and also Iran and China, and also in the other map, they show the affected countries. All these in blue, they are affected countries. So we see the influence of, the, of these regimes on all the world, in Arab region, and also in the democratic countries. But after the challenges that brought that pro democracy social movements faced in Libya and Egypt and Tunisia and Yemen and Syria and Bahrain, does that mean the pro democracy movements in the Arab uprising or Arab Spring have disappeared? I don't think so. Despite the civil war, the Syrian social, social movement has not died. Since 2019, protests occurred in areas under the control of the Syrian regime, Kurdish forces, Islamist group, and the Free Syrian Army. Although demands differed from one area to another, socioeconomic demands were at the each protest core. Moreover, many civil, many civil society organizations were established by Syrian activists in the liberated areas and Syrian exiles. These organizations work on empowering women 
and providing education for Syrians in refugees camps and in other areas inside and outside Syria. Some organizations work on raising awareness about the negotiation process and political rights among Syrians who live outside Syria. The Syrian young lady that survived the Russian full-scale offensive in Aleppo now holds a leading position in one of the organizations that works on women and peace process. Moreover, some of the organizations work on documenting the atrocities that occurred under the Assad regime, its militia and allies, ISIL and other Islamist and Kurdish forces. As a result of these efforts, some countries, such as the United States, enacted legislation such as the Caesar Syrian Civilian Pro Protection Act of 2019, also known as the Caesar Act, which sanctions, which, which sanctions the Syrian government, including President Bashar al-Assad, for, for, for war crimes against the Syrian people. The act was signed by law. The act was signed into law by President Trump in December 2019 and came into effect on June, on June 17, 2022. On the other hand, although the first wave of the Arab uprising resulted in civil wars in, in Yemen and Syria and interrupted democratic transition and challenging transitional paths to democracy as in Tunisia and Libya, the first wave of the Arab uprising or Arab Spring social movements inspired a second wave. The second wave of the Arab uprising erupted in 2019 in countries like Sudan and Algeria, where activists succeeded in removing long-term presidents, Bouteflika and in Algeria. These movements used many slogans in addition to the people demand the fall of regime, including new slogans, which, which was we will not make Egyptians and Syrian mistakes. Recently, pro-democracy activists in Sudan have faced challenges in the transitional period to democracy, but I was informed by many Sudanese activists that people in Sudan are committed to the democratic path and support a civic government. In conclusion, the social movement studies The social movement studies scholars observed that the success of the pro-democracy movements in the world followed decades of struggle against authoritarian regime. Therefore, based on my research in the Arab region, I see that the pro-democracy social movements in the Arab region have gone through many phases. And after each defeat, they learned, reconnected, and invented new ways to challenge the authoritarian regimes in their countries. Activists have been motivated by small success, like change a law, and will continue their struggle until they success in establishing new democratic system. To do so, they required support from other democratic governments, because as President Biden mentioned in the, his summit for democracy address in December 2021, democracy doesn't happen, doesn't happen by accident. Today, many Arabs stand with the Ukrainian democratic government, government because they still have faith in democracy and they believe in what Ukrainians and Ukrainian President Zelensky believe, the light will win over darkness. Thank you.